KISS capitalizes on the momentum from their breakthrough live album and jump back into the studio to try and deliver a more radio-friendly album. Here comes Destroyer. Welcome, friends, to the 3324 podcast. Home base for you if you're into music and movies and you love the the mostly the old stuff, some of the new stuff. We we kind of cover we cover a lot of different things, but uh, in the music and movie genre. So if you like to to sit back and relax and, and hear about some music and movie that shaped shaped Eric and ours lives. Is that right, <laughs> Eric and ours? Yeah, Eric and my that's, life. That's especially our, you're going to get it. <laughs> Apostrophe. Yeah. Yes, shaped yes, our yes. lives, not Eric and ours, but uh, shaped our lives, Eric, including Eric. Yeah. Uh, regardless of whatever it is, you've you've come to the right place. So if it's your first time, welcome aboard. Pull up a chair. We're going to have a great, fun conversation. So looking forward to this. Uh, and we've got new episodes every single week, like clockwork, Eric, right? We del- we're like the post office. We deliver for you. <laughs> yeah. I'm totally geeking out about just worthless. Yeah, the stuff we like. It's yeah. not worthless, though. It, it's not it's to fun. us, but, you know, yeah. so this hopefully. Is, it's yeah. the fun stuff, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, like Robin Williams said in Goodwill Hunting, that's, oh, that's the good stuff. Yes, it is. That's the good stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, and helping us bring the good stuff, making his first appearance of 2024, Mr. Andrew Kremins, uh oh, yeah. backed by a very special guest behind him also. So I want to say first, hi, hi Andy. Uh, go check him out on, on uh, Andrew Kremins Art on Instagram. We're going to put a, a link in the show notes. So go check out what Andy's doing. He's a very busy guy. Uh, I don't think he has enough hands to p- keep in all the jars that he's got of, of things to keep busy with. Is that a fair statement? It's a fair statement. I wish I had more hands. <laughs> <laughs> or or like like uh, Michael Keaton, multiplicity, just make more Andes and yeah. you know, have them do stuff. And, and I, I don't think anybody wants right. that. <clears throat> well, we would like it because then we could always have an Andy. Like we could, you could have a podcast yeah. Andy. Yeah, be permanent. Like, that he just goes and does – yeah, he just comes oh, and does the show. Why does, yeah. why does he get to do the fun stuff? <laughs> Well, then you make, you make him do the dishwashing, Andy, and then okay. you be the Sounds podcast, good. Andy. So yeah. mm. uh, we we wouldn't know though. That's true. No. We, we wouldn't we wouldn't know which one was the pod, which was the real Andy. But no. uh, he is flanked by a very special guest, which we just noticed when he signed on. Not the not the guitar in the background. Right to just to the right of the guitar is a very special uh, friend of ours, a friend of everybody's that likes science fiction is R two D two. Yeah, man, been working on him for a while. Been wanting to get a, uh, a life size R two D two since I was, you know, like born. Uh, so uh, th- th- as you know, technology is progressing and three D printing and all that stuff is getting a lot cheaper. And there's there's websites that have parts here and that, and people do print runs of this or whatever, but. Um, I, I have, I have the, the, the best story you've heard in a long time. I got to tell you this story. Okay. Uh, I recently found out that in, uh, Spanish speaking countries, uh, the subtitles of star Wars, uh, made, it's made R2D2's name, Arturitu, uh, which means little Arthur in Spanish. So there's an entire generation of Spanish speaking kids that grew up thinking that his name is little Arthur. And I think that's the best thing I've ever heard in my life because every time I see my robot, I turn around and I'm like, good morning, little Arthur. Um, yeah. I can't, that made I can't me, not, that made me tear up, man. That's, that's <laughs> I fucking can't, awesome. I can't, yeah. I can't not think of him as little Arthur now. Every time I watch the movies, <laughs> yeah. he's just a perfect little Arthur. Little No, no, Andy. Uh, okay. You, you said something that made me now that uh, I think opened up a whole bunch of other questions. Hopefully we'll get to the album. Uh, we'll get to what we can talk about, but <laughs> did, did you, did you 3d print that? No, there's a lot okay. of pieces. No, 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 no. Some of the pieces are 3d printed though. Okay. Uh, yeah. There's little, like the little cables on his feet and stuff yeah. like that, but there's, okay. yeah, they're all different kinds of parts and molds and all that stuff. Yep. Okay. I'm, Cause I'm like, wow, that is, yeah. Yes. 3d printing has come a long way if you're able to. And there's some long- guys. Yeah. There's some guys that, do, that do have 3D printed yeah. ones so with the, the the right amount of, uh, you know, Bondo. Uh, yeah. You can make anything. So, How long did it take to get everything, all the parts? Um, Probably, I don't know, four or five months. Uh, okay. You know, but I mean, like it's – the cool thing is, is like when I really started – and I'm sorry if this is boring, but That's like okay. when I really no, no. first really got Star into Wars it. Star Wars boring? No. Um. <laughs> Like years ago, I really been wanted to do it. There's a website called the, the Astro Mac. Uh, there's 
astromech.net, I think. And then there's uh, the Droid Builders Club that these guys would do print runs and stuff. But if you wanted to have like a chrome uh, metal version like they do in the movies, it's something it's close to twenty thousand dollars. And it's uh, it takes like 18 months to put together and you've got like electronics and all this mm. stuff or whatever. So it's it's just a, a whole other if you find people that can do a mold of a of, of the torso then like if it's all one-to-one scale and all the blueprints are online you can get all the stuff you know yeah. like the, wow. the electronics i don't know yeah. man he looks pretty good to me yeah very, very neat <laughs> very neat now for, for those of you that are listening and not watching us you've got a reason to go over to youtube uh True. to check out the video version of this because you'll see oh, right behind andy is a, a beautiful uh gorgeous replica of little arthur um, so absolutely, uh, looks, it looks fantastic. So yeah, go go absolutely go check it. Check us out on YouTube, and then while you're there, go ahead and subscribe because you never know what's going to be behind uh, our guests when they join us. You never know what'll be back there. We've had uh, we've had what Emmy awards with Mr. Kevin Howard and all kinds of other things. So um, we've got R two D two though. I think he takes the most interesting background right now. For now, huh? I actually I was on a work call with people that I that I work with, and a couple of them are. Spanish speaking, and I told the the little Arthur story, and they're like, "Yeah, I mean, well, that's that's huh. his name, right?" And I'm like, "It's true. The story's true." So, <laughs> and uh, yeah, they're like, "Yeah, little Arthur, you know." I'm like, "Good lord, everything you heard was true." That that is neat, and I love it. And you know what? We're we're in we're in the same ballpark because a year before Star Wars came out, this album came out from Kiss Destroyer. So uh, let's get into eric's favorite word of of recently the statistics because <laughs> <laughs> dj's always used to say in stats Stat- like well stats I, that's what i have little... on my note on my notes it says let's talk stats well, st- the okay. stats is getting a little stale i guess uh, yeah. but statistic you know statistics I mean, why not go for the whole yeah we're we're we're, we're fancy to sound a little bit smarter <laughs> And what it, it, you know what? After all this time, it ain't working. Hasn't no. worked. Well, you know what? We'll keep we'll keep swinging. So we're going to give you some statistics, like we do in every single episode. We always start out with oh. great factual information. So here it comes. This was released released. Okay, mm. it was released in March of 1976. Produced by Bob Ezrin, who was a big time producer uh, at Ooh. the time. Really, Alice Cooper was was really what attracted his work with Alice Cooper is what attracted Kiss. Uh, to, 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 you know, uh, seeking out Bob Ezrin. Uh, there were four singles that were released. Shout it out loud, hit number 31. Flaming Youth flamed out at 74. Detroit Rock City didn't really chart, but there was another song that was on the flip side, which they ended up releasing as a single, which was Beth, which hit number seven, which would be their biggest hit single. They really yeah. kind of, uh, especially since it was their, their last, uh, single release that, the album was was kind of pe- had peaked, and then people, you know, then DJs picked up on the flip side of of this uh, Detroit Rock City, and Beth was on it, uh, and then they decided to release Beth as a single, and it just went gangbusters. Uh, hit number eleven on Billboard and two times platinum, which would be to date, as far as I know, Kiss's biggest, still their biggest selling album, uh, and it and it only it hit two times platinum in twenty eleven. Is it finally finally hit there? So. Um, I can't Andy, believe- Andy is our resident Kiss fan, so we're gonna defer. Uh, you know, if, if I get anything wrong, except for when we get to our our segment, uh, three lies and a truth, because that is factually some of it is incorrect on purpose. But we'll, when we get to that, but other than that, feel free to correct me if I have anything wrong, except for my opinions. No, I'm sure you're right. <laughs> uh, it's it shocks me though that uh, Flaming Youth charted higher than Detroit Rock City. That's crazy. Yeah. I, I remember Detroit. Uh, that song was all over the radio, though. Heavy airplay on the FM stations. I, re- yeah. as I recall. Beth used to be played on AM stations. Oh, yeah. Beth was huge. I remember hence, when the, was- hence the mono version. When I, yes, yes, Andy, I listened to the, the anniversary edition and a lot of those demos and stuff. And they do have the mono mix of, of Beth. And I rem- you know, so that reminds me of the listening, you know, putting on AM station, not knowing yeah. it was Kiss at the time. You know, because that always blew my mind that that song came from the same band. But uh, yeah, yeah, Beth, but, Beth uh, was a big I, in '76. <laughs> I remember too; it was all over the radio, and it was big, and it kind of, yeah, kind of put Kiss over the top. And, and you know, um, Kiss. I, I you know, I, let's start here, Andy. Before we get into Destroyer, I think we got to talk a little bit about Kiss. And I think Kiss can be a very divisive or divisive, depending on how you pronounce it, very divisive band. I think there, there's the fervent followers, and I want to shout out one, Chris Navara. 
uh, is is a fervent Kiss fan. When I told him we were doing Destroyer, we we start it started a whole conversation a couple of days ago. Um, so there are those those Kiss fans that are you know part of the Kiss army. Yeah, it, it, fair to say they are they a love them or hate them. Oh yeah, either, of course. Either you either get it or you don't, right? Yeah, is that, yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. I I've I have Eric's known me for twenty five years. I have always been an unapologetic Kiss fan, um, just because like. I mean, I, I'm all in. I'm I'm the lunchbox, the toothpaste, the caskets, the condoms, whatever. I you know I'm not going to buy it, of course. But I mean, like, I, I'm I'm all over it. I mean, like, it, it's just when 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 they were the biggest, I was a little kid, and they were presented in such a way that they just weren't human. They weren't human beings, and I was young mm-hmm. enough to believe that. And there was like, there were no humans behind that makeup. They were comic book characters come to life, and mm-hmm. I can't express that enough. Like it. it I can still put myself in that position to where they were just, you know, aliens or something, you know, like when they, when they came to town on tour, it was like meeting the actual Spider-Man or something was was actually coming. They, they just, they weren't real. And my uncle and my sister were huge fans. So I grew up as a toddler, basically seeing kiss posters and action mm-hmm. figures and comic books everywhere. So just, they were like a whole other thing. And then there was music also, which was really cool. So like, I, if I were, have, if I had never seen them or been exposed to them in the, in the manner that I was, would I be as huge of a fan? I don't know, you know, but I mean, it's, there was, it was the full package to me. It was the marketing, it was the toys, it was the music, it was, it was something completely different. I mean, you didn't see like, uh, I, I don't know, Jethro Tull, uh, action figures, you know, so it's like, yeah. It, it, it was just, it was the, it was everything that I wanted. It was the energy. It was the, the, the different characters, the Kabuki makeup, the comic books, the fire, the blood, the space lasers, the, you know, everything. It was just, <laughs> you know, uh, so it, it I, I, I can't objectively make anybody believe that this is good music. I can't sit down and make the case and say, that sweet pain from this album is a great song. <laughs> but, but what about what about great expectations? Great expectations is the dumbest Kiss song that's ever been recorded. <laughs> Thank and you I for will, saying. I will go on record to say that okay. Destroyer is my favorite Kiss album, and, okay. and, and Great Expectation is the dumbest Kiss song ever. Made. I mean, there's mm-hmm. and that's saying a lot because they've got some pretty dumb songs, but. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's just one of those things. I'm in. I'm in for a penny in for a pound sort yeah. of thing. So, but I mean, like you, you get older, and unfortunately, due to uh, uh, you know reality TV shows, you get to learn who Gene Simmons really is as mm. a person and that sort of stuff. And then you get it. You're like, oh boy, I don't want to know this. And yeah. so, yeah. Uh, you 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 learn to like separate the art from the artist over time and stuff. So like when I when I, I just I saw them twice on their farewell tour. You know, twice on the same farewell tour. Um, and uh, at the same town, they came back. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm watching them and and that's the demon singing. That, that's not the guy from Gene Simmons family jewels. In my yeah. opinion, I, my brain just shuts it off. It's a whole other thing. Mm. Otherwise I, you know, you have to think about that yeah, stuff, I, but I don't, I, I, yeah. But so, yeah, the, I, the, I, yeah, sorry, go ahead. The, no, no, the, 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 you know, you start, you started, the, the first thing you started talking about was the iconography of Kiss. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there's not, there's no other band. And when I'm like, insane clown posse none of that crap counts yeah like like there was no other band that that took like that took this idea and ran with it so so yeah there was the glam thing that was going on right right eric uh david bowie with ziggy stardust and kind of you know there was that whole there there was that whole kind of sub sub genre of music but kiss went full in yeah i i mean i frankly i don't understand the the bad rap that they get you know, there were plenty of bands at that time, not even bands that we even know. I mean, there's a lot of like underground bands in the, during the 70s who were doing kind of the same thing. Ridiculous, you know, makeup, the whole bit. I mean, Kiss, yeah, took it to that real huge level. They knew what they were doing, though. That's the thing that they could, they just leaned right into what they were doing and they, mm-hmm. they did it brilliantly. It's, it's entertainment. It is like, like Andy was saying, it's, it's as a kid, you're, you're totally enamored by it. You know, I, 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 re- I remember seeing imagery. Um, of course, my brother, you know, had the album. He also had Kiss Alive and Kiss Alive 2 and uh, all that stuff. So I was exposed to it really early on. And I just I thought it was cool, too. It was like these guys in makeup and, and then they made the movie at that point. Yeah. The Kiss meets the Phantom and all that stuff. So it's like, yeah, yeah, 
it's campy. It's really, but you know, when you're a kid, it was just, especially you know, at that time, up. especially at that time in the seventies, it feels like you were getting away with something by yeah. being allowed to look at their album covers and to be like, they were, they, they were safe uh, horror, you know, like parents yeah. didn't know what to do, yeah. deal with them. But you know, so, but the, the um, I mean, there were, yeah, like, remember Peter Gabriel had those big fruit heads and all that, you know. Well, absolutely. There was, Genesis, yeah. yeah. I mean, they, so, I mean, yeah. I mean, what it's, it's, to me, it's, it's all part and parcel to what was going theater. on in the 70s. Yeah. Theater, it's, theater. It's, it's, it's whatever could grab the, your attention. ABBA had some pretty wild outfits yeah. from what I could recall. Yeah. Earth, Wind, and Fire. I mean, you know, you think of the, the period, the time, and I, it just, they, they just leaned into it. Maybe, maybe a bit more than other people did, but. But like Andy pointed out, the music was there. They had some good songs. They had some not so good songs, but you know. Well, I think that I think that's you know. where the bad rap comes in, Andy. And you can correct me if I'm yeah. wrong. Is is they're never thought of as great musicians. That's the thing. It was mm. it was more. It it seemed like their reputation was more sizzle than steak. It's like yeah, yeah. everything's flashy. They're they're gurgling blood and, and blowing fire. But they're not, you know, great. And, and on this album or everything I was reading, like Ace Freely kept on getting, like they would just replace him and have another guitar player come in and, you know, you know, cause he wasn't really, you know, up to snuff. So I think that's, I think that's the kind of baggage that they carried is it was more about the image and more about the marketing. Right. And I think that's what mm-hmm. turned some people off too, is like, okay, this is like a gimmick and we get it, but what, what else, what else is there to, to it? Right. Well, is they, that kind of. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the unforgivable sin is they came out and said, unapologetically, we're here to make money. We're here to get girls. We're here to, you know, like if if my if we can put our logo on a belt, we're going to do it. <clears throat> so like that was the thing, like all the other bands were in the corner being all artistic and be like, oh, it's, you know, d- degrading the art and all this stuff or whatever. And Gene Simmons is like, you know, well, I'll put that art on a on an action figure or something or, you know, or, or a magazine mm-hmm. or whatever. But the thing is though, it's like how many, if you're, if you're going to go like gimmick or any of this stuff, I mean, even something like spinal tap, like how many spinal tap songs can you name? Uh, or like, think of like really big, I mean, I guess spinal taps a bad example, but think, think of all the gimmick bands in history mm-hmm. and name three of their songs. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that there is something past that where you can say like, yeah, everybody yeah. knows rock and roll all night. Everybody knows Detroit rock city. Or, I mean, mm-hmm. you sell that there's, so they have some stake to that sizzle. Uh, you know, there, there's a mm-hmm. lot of, uh, a lot of hits there. And there was a point in time where, and people forget this, they ruled the planet. Like they were, there was nothing bigger than these guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, all over the country. I mean, like the people in Japan and everything else were just falling all over them. Um, so, you know, I guess it's just because they were so, their, their iconography and their makeup and it was so accessible and marketable to all different languages yep. that they're watching the show yeah. and, and listening to the music at the same time. But, uh, you know, just iconography doesn't sell records and they sold, you know, a lot of records. Yeah, they, so. they put on shows. I mean, they they were, you know, if, if nothing else, too, they, you know, much like kind of like the probably the Grateful Dead business model of just tour. They were always out touring, touring, touring and always preaching to the masses. Right. And always get, getting themselves in front. So they, it wasn't like they were these cartoon characters, like a fake band, like the Archies, like. Like yeah. it wasn't like they were, yeah. they were these <laughs> guys and then you didn't really know, you know, like it was actually different musicians playing. It's like, yeah, they went out and and brought that that show to your local town and they did it every year every year yeah. and very prolific what you know one of the things i wrote down is is by the time this album came out they had had they put out five albums in two years not including not mm-hmm. including kiss alive so five yeah. albums and a live album so <clears throat> if nothing else these guys were were in it to win it from a <clears throat> musical standpoint you know i mean no one talks about gene simmons as like being you never hear him in, in best bass player lists yeah. yeah, Ace Freely will come up as a guitar icon, uh, but but no one else really does. So you know, and that's that to me. That was always kind of the the yin and the yang of it. Is is you know these guys are so well regarded, but but no one really talks about the musicianship. And that that's what always kind of like yeah. when I was young. Yeah, I I you know t- I, I checked out the Kiss Dynasty album from the library and listened to I Was Made to, for Loving You. And one Halloween, I was Peter Chris. I did the makeup. Um, but then after that, I kind of, I kind of, you know, in, in full disclosure, I kind of put Kiss to the side. I'm like, yeah, you know, not really for like at the time, not really for me, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so well, what, it, when it came it, to do this album, right? And that's why when, when Eric sent me the list, I'm like, yeah, you know what? I want to do this. And what I what I did, what my approach was, was I, I listened to it and I had my first reactions to it. And then I had a listen. I listened to this. I probably listened to this album more than any album I've ever listened to for a show that we've done. I think it's safe for me to say, because what I what I was doing was actually flushing out my Kiss bias. Is literally what I was doing. Is because I had all these preconceived notions, and I could have listened to it and be like, "Oh, this is just more of that kind of stuff." I kept listening to it. And and kind of got further deeper into it, and kind of under you know some of the stuff that turned me off in the beginning, I've I kind of warmed up to, and then mm. actually ended up in, enjoying it, you know, because I knew <laughs> I had that in, that inherent bias about Kiss of uh, this is just going to be like you know, and it is sex drugs. I mean that's what they they that's what they sing about, but which yeah. is okay. Everybody no else about that's, it, yeah, yeah. That's what rock and roll is for Christ's sake, right. I've, but, but, I've, but Kiss, yeah. you know, Kiss has that that extra like reputation, the hedonism, and and all that other yeah. kind of stuff. So I wanted to give them their their due. So I just kept listening, listening, and, and kind of flushed out all of like the. And I've come through it like a, with a, with a lot more respect. I have to say, uh, Destroyer has always been my favorite album. But I've always in my the back of my mind kind of pictured Destroyer and Love Gun as kind of like a double album because they came out within months of each other like 15 months yeah. of each other yeah and um i think that all of my favorite songs are i mean i've got other ones as well but i mean like as a collective those two albums um are uh where where, where it's at for me but um they they went in with the beatles mindset they wanted to have four individual characters that sang different songs did harmonies Everybody could pick their favorite, you know, it, it, the, the quiet drummer, the flashy guitar player, that sort of stuff. And um, Gene Simmons, like to this day, was always will, will talk over and over again about how he wanted to be the Beatles. He wanted to be the Beatles. And um, that that was, if you watch their kind of, their, their history or the, their career, you can kind of see them starting off trying to like find their way. And mm-hmm. like there's some songs in there that kind of feel a little Beatlesy and stuff like that. Then they kind of get into the more the, the, the dirtier rock and roll stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, like if uh, if if you're still clearing out that bias, check out Love Gun. But I mean, there's there's I started know, to listen to it actually. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Both albums have uh, are, are done by the same the, the album covers, which are huge for yeah. me. That's the, one of the reasons why I, I got into you know art uh, rock and roll art to begin with was Ken Kelly, who's the guy who, who painted. He's a, a fantasy artist who did all kinds of like Conan the Barbarian and stuff mm-hmm. like that, like Boris yeah. Vallejo kind of guy. And uh, he also did stuff for like <laughs> Man of War and Rainbow and stuff. But, um, you know, the, those album covers, I would just sit there and stare at them because they, the, the, again, subjective imagery, you're hearing something that sounds a little bit naughty. I mean, like this, the song Great Expectations is, like I said, the dumbest <laughs> Kiss song. But when you're, you know, nine years old and you're listening to this song, then those lyrics, you're like, looking out the window or looking out the door to see if, <laughs> if your mom can hear like I, 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 make sure no she, one's watching. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it just, it felt exciting and new and stuff like that to, to a young kid, you know? Yeah. It's impressionable. It's yeah. the whole, it's all about impression being the resident prog fan. I mean, uh, the, the advent of having Bob Ezrin of all people produced this record. He produced the wall. For yeah. Pink Floyd. He produced Peter Gabriel's first record. He did, you know, so he's an established, presence there i mean they didn't just get some you know some schlug to produce their stuff so this it gave them some credibility i think if anybody's really paying attention to who produced the album um but there it is you know so i mean again just a lot of this stuff during that time the excess and and us talking about this stuff going back revisiting it i'm revisiting stuff that i thought that i put away a long time ago myself and now coming back to it and it just, you know, so it's a lot of fun to, to kind of re dig in and maybe you even get a better perspective or a better, you know, understand that they might not have been taking this seriously, you know, as much as we thought they might have yeah. been at the time, you know what I mean? And, and thinking, Oh, you know, compared to this band, they suck and all this kind of thing, but it's all like part of the, the tapestry of, of the stuff that, we, that was there on the scene. Yeah, so, and, and I, I don't think you know. I don't think Kiss is comparable. Kiss isn't comparable. There's no other band you can really compare Kiss to. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, their their contemporaries were the Eagles and Fleetwood Mac, and you yeah. know, 
what you know, whatever you know, Led Zepp, like it was so diverse, but but they they weren't anything like any of them because of of how they dressed and because of how they presented their stage shows. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah you know, they fit shows. in with rock and roll, like like Aerosmithy, I suppose, kind of stuff. You know, yeah. as far as as far as content uh, lyrically, but. Um, but they were so they solely occupied a, a space that no one else. Da- I, I I I I dare say no one else dared go into. Mm-hmm. Also, there weren't other. If if I'm if memory serves, there weren't Kiss knockoffs. No, there weren't I mean, other bands that were trying to like like really b- bite no. off on that. You know, there was t- there were bands around that time as well that were just playing with the regular like bell bottoms and like no no house lights. The house lights weren't even off. You know, and yeah. these guys came out and like everything <laughs> yeah. is on fire for two hours. So yeah, yeah. maybe I, Alice Cooper would be the closest yeah. because he was very theatrical as well, and, and kind of yeah. he, he went he really went the whole horror route though. I mean, he was doing like decapitations, right, and kind of yeah, you know. All, but 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 Kiss, like I said, kind of occupied a very unique space because they all because they also transcended that, and, and that's what they were trying to do on this album with Bob Ezrin is they were trying to refine that sound. They wanted to get something that was that was going to reach the bigger masses because Bob Ezrin. Mm-hmm. I read I read stuff with Bob about Bob Ezrin. He goes, I went to go see a Kiss. He goes, I went to go see a, a, a Kiss concert when they asked me to work with them. And he goes, the very strange thing about it was it was all guys in the audience. It was mm-hmm. all all yeah. young like teen guys. Yeah. And, and Bob Ezrin, <laughs> Bob Ezrin was like, if we can get women to like, if we can make an album that that will get women to come to the shows they'll conquer and they you know, and so that's why you saw songs like Beth on there and some of the other ones yeah. to try and not you know to moderate moderate the sound a little bit while still re- while it's still being kissed but to reach a broader audience and you know I would say for for that uh, if that's the mission then I say, I would say mission accomplished Andy well they had mm-hmm. uh that youthful rebellion thing about you know uh, first I drank then I smoke those kind of lyrics but then you have like you know the song "Flaming Youth" is kind of a silly song, but I mean, like it's a, it's a, it's a, not silly, but it's not uh, it's Shakespeare, you know. But mm-hmm. like the, no. the, the 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 lyrics, uh, I'm just gonna read the, the lyrics. Yep. My parents think I'm crazy and they hate the things I do. I'm stupid and I'm lazy, man. If they only knew how flaming youth is gonna set the world on fire. Flaming youth, our flag is flying higher. It's like getting the kids active and you know activated. And going, you know, like it's that yep. thing where you're a kid, your mom just yelled at you, you go and you throw in your kiss record and uh, he's your parents think I'm crazy. Yeah, me too, man. You know, so it's there was there was something there, you know, I, there's not a lot of uh, contemporaries doing that around that time were talking directly to the kids. They were they were doing their highfalutin mm-hmm. kind of like mm-hmm. talking about and, adulthood. And as kids, we thought that stuff was poetry. Yeah. You know, that was as good as it gets, you know, like, yeah. you know, as lyrically, I mean, you know, so yeah, we took it all in. Um, well, and- Flaming Youth, I got to say, it's a catchy, it's a damn catchy song though. Yeah. yeah. Like that, that's the thing is, is, you know, it doesn't have to be Shakespeare. It doesn't yeah. have to make big statements. It, it's easy to listen to. And, and uh, especially in that one, Paul Stanley gives a great vocal performance. Right. And I think that's ha- like, ha- you know, half of it is you can, you can have hokey lyrics, it's if is it it's can you sell them? Yeah, and and that's the thing with with Paul Stanley is he can sell that stuff, you know, and that's why something like Great Expectations. So, so we're going to get into the album now. Finally, we're going to start talking about it. <laughs> um, like I wrote Great Expect. <laughs> Here's what I wrote: Great Expectations is the worst song I've ever heard. <laughs> but and then I wrote, but it got better. I I, I kind of, when I first heard, I'm like. Gene Simmons is is a, a horrible vocalist. I'm like he he just really is not a great even on God of Thunder. I, I know God of Thunder is almost a parody, um, and and uh, I want to acknowledge the email that Andy sent or a couple days ago. Andy sent an email and he goes here's a here's a demo version of God of Thunder that Paul because Paul Stanley wrote it and here's his demo and it worked it up and um. I, I dug that version. It was a disco. A yeah, disco and, and a lot of people, a lot of the comments on YouTube, are, they put, a lot of the kids, like, they're like, I kind of like this. I like I like the, the Gene Simmons version, but I like that one for two. But um, so, yeah, you, so, so, you know, God of Thunder is probably like one of their hallmark, I'm guessing yeah. one of their concert staples. Yeah, that's that's essentially Gene Simmons' theme song, which is yeah, so funny because Paul Stanley wrote it. Yeah. But, um, it's just that thumping, like, metal like it, it's like one of the most doom metal songs that they did i mean they did uh, they 
re- reunited with Ezra and I think uh, a little bit later in, in the Revenge album, right? And uh, they had a song called Unholy that was very, um, it might've been not been Ezra, but some, they, they went back to mm-hmm. the roots on that album and it was very evil sounding, you know, but um, I, you, you forgive what he lacks in vocal talent by his personality and it, it fits. Like you don't yeah. want, a demon up there singing like Paul Stanley, you know? All right. Yeah. Uh, so, but I mean, every time that song comes on, you know, like it gets smoky and it's all red and it's demonic. And it's just like, it's, it's part of the, it's part of the opera, you mm-hmm. know, the, the, the kiss opera sort of thing. So um, I, I, it's just, it's, it, it holds such a, a great place in my heart just because of that. Yeah. I, and in listening to this album, first couple of times I'm li- I listened to it, I'm like, wow, this, to me, Eric, you could jump jump in on this too. I thought the album sounded underproduced. I'm like, you know, I was ex- from a Kiss album. I'm expecting like, you know, what you see on mm-hmm. stage or when you you're like like big, really bombastic in your face. And I, I wasn't feeling it. I was like, kind of, I was like, oh, it sounds like it, there should be more like like oomph behind it. The problem was, <laughs> I needed to turn it up. When you turn this album up loud, there you go. It's a difference maker. If you listen to this kind of at a normal volume, you're gonna be like, "Oh, okay." Uh, I was yeah. kind of like, "Yeah," I, w- I was kind of under underwhelmed. And then I turned it loud, and I'm like, "Oh, okay." That's that's the that's it. the mindset. That is the the headspace of uh, bands like older, you know, newer bands that are doing older stuff. Like they're still trying to do like analog kind of thing. And there's a couple of bands that I, that I like that that have Neve consoles and they're still, so their albums sound a little bit unremarkable, but yes, you have to turn it up that that's what you had to do back in the day. Nowadays, everything is recorded so loud. And so just like, it's like right there, you could have it on three and it's like, it's not any different (laughs) than if you were to, to like really, you know, uh, but yeah, but that was the point. You know, and a lot of times too is like producers always had the sense to say, you guys need to be a little bit more restrained on on the vinyl because you because you are that big bombastic live band. Mm. You need to save it for the show. So let's 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 just put the music out there. The people paying attention, they're they're gonna they're gonna listen to it, they're gonna like some of the songs, the grooves, but when they see you on stage, you're gonna give them something more. And there it is. So that you know, so this was and they are undoubtedly one of the biggest live acts, I guess at the time and, and more, you know, and it just, yeah. So, it, you know, the formula worked, I feel, yeah. you know, so yeah, when you say that the album is unremarkable, uh, maybe it was supposed to be. Well, know, underproduced. Cool, cool. It just, it sounded like yeah, there yeah. should have been more, but then when I turned yeah. it up, it was like, then it, it kind of, uh, kind of bloomed, mm-hmm. you know, I'm kind of like, Oh, okay. Now, now I'm kind of getting the force, you know, I was listening to my car and you know, listening in my car. And I'm like, yeah, I was like, yeah, okay. Right. But then when I got home and I cranked it, I'm like, oh, it, it really was a, a difference maker, especially like, you know, Detroit Rock City segueing into King of the Nighttime World. I'm like, yeah, you know, th- those to me, Andy, those are like a, that's like a one two punch song. I love when yeah. when when artists can really put two songs together and especially when they when they put the car crash in between it and then it just goes right into King of the Nighttime World. I'm like that, that kind of stuff. I love when it's done well and they did it well there. They just kind of rolled into the next one. Didn't stop. There was, um, yeah, I mean, when I was a kid, you know, the, the, the imagination would go wild when you're hearing this stuff and the car crash would go, it just crashes and does the, <laughs> does the, 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 the uh, warbly guitar yeah. it goes right into that guitar into the next song. And in yeah. my mind, that was like a part of an engine or something like just being like waving in the wind, you know, or something going into the thing. But they were um, really good at anthem songs you know like king mm-hmm. of the nighttime world it, it's it's a good song or whatever but then at the end it's got the uh, king of the nighttime world you could just see the the pyrotechnics going up and <laughs> yeah. you know um at the at the very end there you know and like shout it out loud and you, you know rock and roll night and they just had so many anthem songs that got the crowd going and you know that they probably they were all about the marketing they knew how to get the records and and i mean they were in it to to sell it so like they knew what to do Mm -hmm. uh except for the elder they didn't know what they were doing when the elder came out but um (laughs) songs from the elder oh my god (laughs) that's the time that's when they tried to get 
oh, we're trying to be serious now. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. I, I read that there was album. supposed to be a, yeah. uh, Andy, I read there was supposed to be a movie attached to that at some point. And that's why the to a lot of people the album didn't make sense because the movie never came out and then they shuffled mm. the track listing around anyway. So people didn't really know a, a, about it. But um Destroyer, I, I think, you know, talk about anthem songs. I mean, Detroit Rock City, King of the Nighttime World, God of Thunder, um, Flaming Youth. I, I, that's it. That's kind of a fist pumper, right? That's like a yeah. that's like a, an arena rock song. And of course, shout it out loud. Yep. I mean, you've got like you've got the Kiss blueprint on, on this album for someone for someone that's never really for someone that's never if someone's thinking about listening to Kiss or you, if you have that bias and you look at them like, oh, my God, it's just like it's too much. Give destroy. I think. I think. Just. I think. Andy, would you say that this this is the album for someone to? Sure, but I I think that like the the album that I played the most as a kid was Double Platinum, which was oh. a cheat because it's like well, yeah, it's, a, it's, it, it, it's a cheat. But reasons. I mean, if you're gonna sit down, <laughs> if you're gonna yeah. sit down and put on an album, I would say this or Love Gun. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and it's, it's funny because Love Gun. You know, it's got all these great songs, and then it's got the song Christine Sixteen that. Uh, everybody loved yeah. back in the day, but yeah. you know it's uh, problematic at, to say the very least. But I mean, like it, that. that um, <laughs> there was a song called "Funky Cold Medina" back in the eighties from yeah, uh, Loke. yeah, he sampled that song. That dun, 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 um, is from Christine Sixteen. Anyway, um, going back to uh, what we were talking about about uh, Great Expectations being. Yes, a dumb song. Um, <laughs> it's also kind of redundant, and I don't want to turn this into a bitch session. But like, oh. um, "Do You Love Me" at the end of this album uh, has got the same thing. He's just like, you know, I in, in Great Expectations, he's like, I play the guitar and my fingers and all this stuff, and then like in "Do You Love Me," he's like, "You really like my limousine? You like the yeah. wheel, way the wheels roll?" Um, it's the same thing. It's the same like thematically, you know, they're the same. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's that th- t- look at how awesome I am and I know how much you love me, but are, you know, or do you love me? That's sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, it's just pretty funny. Cause like, you know, when it comes down to like street cred, yeah, Nir- Nirvana, like, it, it, and, and, and anthrax and like a, a lot of these bands that people hold in really high regard were huge kiss fans, you know, like Nirvana yeah. re- uh, did a cover of, do you love me? And on the back of Ner- Nevermind, the, the, the back of the album cover, there's like a picture of a monkey with a bunch of meat, behind him like a collage mm-hmm. that, um that uh Kurt Cobain put together there's a picture of Kiss like there's the monkey and then there's like a mountain of meat and and like on top of it is Kiss so it's like you know it, it it's like a band are they a band's band maybe I don't know but I, I guess not because it's mostly musicians that don't like him so I I, I don't know yeah, I don't know what but, people but want. You, you make a, you know it's funny you make a good point with great expectations and do you love me because it's it's two songs that are that are basically the same thing thematically but the execution is really you know do, do you love me is much more again it's much more anthemic and and yeah. kind of and, and I read an article about great expectations uh, and, and the guy was trying to figure out if this was supposed to be a serious song or if it was supposed to be tongue in cheek and they knew. And, and the guy kind of determined at the end that he thinks it was supposed to be serious because Gene Simmons was very passionate about completing it and finishing it and wanting it to have a certain, you know, have the choir and do all these things. The choir kind of reminds me a little bit of, you can't always get what you want. I was kind of like, is, yeah. he, is he trying to like get a little bit yeah. of, of the stones in there? Um, but yeah, his, his lyrics for me, they're just a little too smarmy. You know, oh. that, that's what the, with with Gene Simmons, it's like a little bit too much. It's like it, it, he goes, you know, sweet pain. It's kind of like, uh, you know, they, they don't they 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 don't age well. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I mean, so uh, to to piggyback on that, it's I a mean, great it, song, Sweet Pain. I like it. It's very catchy. But, you know. Yeah. I mean, but I yeah, there's there's at least three or four great songs on every one of their albums. Uh, and then there's a lot of stinkers. And I, I'm <laughs> saying, I'm saying that as a huge fan, like uh, a huge mm-hmm. fan, I will put up with anything that they put out at least once. Uh, but there's, um, you know, some of the, like almost the entire unmasked album is kind of not great, but um, what was I going to say? Oh, they, they were very conscious. Like I was saying earlier about the anthemic stuff and whatever, but I mean, like I, I've read all their, every one of them individually wrote autobiographies and listened to the audio books and all that stuff. And uh, Gene Simmons even wrote a book called kiss and makeup, which is pretty funny, but um, 
it about the history of Kiss and stuff, but it's all from one sided, you know. Yeah, I was gonna I, say yeah. revisionist history. I'm yeah, sorry. <laughs> but I mean, I, I got to meet Peter Chris and uh, Ace Fraley's been at the horror movie convention and stuff that we that, that I do artwork for and stuff. But like Peter Chris was just the sweetest guy. We talked to him forever. My my wife and I. He had um, male breast cancer for a while, so he was really? like doc, like part of his like. Uh, convention circuit was to tell guys to check themselves out to make sure that they don't have male breast cancer. But um, uh, Paul Stanley would be listening to the radio and said, it would hear like uh, he heard Brandy, you're a fine girl, that song. And he's like, we need one of those. Uh, so he wrote, so he wrote hard luck woman. So, Cause so it was like, he would hear like, he'd be collecting songs and then writing songs based on what he liked or what he mm. thought the kiss needed and stuff, which was pretty cool. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I met Ace Freely a couple of times because he used to live uh, one town over from Dobbs Ferry. He lived in Irvington, and then he lived in, in the 80s, and he lived in Greenberg. Uh, and he he uh, one of his kids, uh, he had his kid's birthday party in the pizzeria that I used to work in. So, you know, oh, wow. used to, I used to deliver, I delivered pizza to Ace a couple of times, too. So, but that was in his in the 80s. Was he, so he, was was he conscious? A, yeah, I was going to say, he was in kind of in, in, in you know, Never Never Land. Well, I heard he was <laughs> didn't at the time that you know people were saying to him you know he was kind of an asshole at that at that point like he had like was too good for Kiss and he thought he's, he was he's you know, always been a little high on his own supply as okay. it were yeah. yeah I just wasn't sure about that but it's just that, that's you know I remember yeah I remember I mean, those I, days when you know you had seen him and yeah yeah it's like blew my mind oh my God. yeah we worked in Jimmy's you know even like you know Tommy and like oh he's yeah. really from Kiss you know the, you know. But uh, yeah, uh, but I always heard that he was kind of, uh, you know, a little, yeah, you know, whatever. He was full, full, full he was of probably, himself? He's probably, just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he probably is. But I mean, like there, it, it, he was just always high. And like, if you, I, I'm, I still follow him on Facebook and he'll post, you know, uh, videos all the time of him. Like, yeah, I'm just going up to Walmart. He's just like, to this day. <laughs> He it sounds like he had a stroke or something from all the uh, drugs. Uh, oh wow! But he just the way he the way he talks is just uh, he is either drunk or he has done so much that he uh, I don't I think he's sober. He's supposed to be sober, but um, yeah, I think so. He uh, he's done a lot of damage, you know. Yeah. Which I, there's not. I mean, it, it happens, but I mean, it's just uh, it's it's a shame. I think that he, um, you know, it's it's just in the autobiographies, Gene talks about the fact that he's never been drunk in his entire life. He's only been stoned once uh, against his will. Wow. So, um, he, it, yeah, it's Gene Simmons. But anyway, he, <laughs> um, they, he had absolutely no tolerance for drugs or yep. you know, being drunk and, and never thought it was funny and that sort of stuff. So there was always that tension between him, him and Paul versus, uh, Gene. Yeah. And there's Peter. that, that famous, mm-hmm. uh, sorry, uh, uh, Ace and Peter. That famous interview on on YouTube, you can find it with the t- uh, with Ke- uh, Tom Snyder. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. Where where Ace is just totally ripped and drunk, and 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 Gene and uh, Gene and and uh, Paul are just trying to manage him, manage him through the interview. Uh, yeah. Before before we get back to Destroyer, there is it. There is we got to ring the bell. We do have an ELO. Kiss nice. connection, of course we do, because Ace Freely is known for his cover of Do Ya. That's one of the like, one really? of his famous covers oh. is Do yeah. which was is an ELO song. It's actually a song by the Move, but written by Jeff Lynn. And that's uh, uh, wasn't that he, when he was uh, Freely's comment. comment? Yep, yep, yep. yep. That was that his thing. Is, so yep. mm-hmm. um, let's let's talk a little bit about yes uh, ye- yesterday. I wrote Beth is kisses <laughs> yesterday. That's why I said yesterday. But Beth yeah. is kind of the kind of the outlier, right? They they didn't really want this on the album. They were kind of like you know, again, you know, we we. There's a lot of revisionist history. When you read about stuff, when you read new interviews about old stuff from Paul, uh, Paul Stanley or Gene Simmons, the, apparently the story seemed to change a lot. He didn't really write this, you know, Peter Chris didn't really write the song, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And um, but apparently what what is true though is is it was originally called Beck. Mm-hmm. Right? It was about this girl named Becky who was really clingy to her boyfriend and kept calling the studio, like, when are you coming home? And, and they wrote this song. And then I think Bob Ezra was like, well, we need to kind of, we want to make it a little bit nicer and make her not so like psychotic. So it's more about, Hey, I'm on the road or we're trying to, trying to do it. So how does Beth fit in, Andy, how does Beth fit in into the kiss world with you? Is it, is it one that you tolerate and kind of like, uh. yeah, I mean, it was ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitous before I was conscious, you know, to 
the band and stuff. So it was, it was already around. It was already part. Like I, I, I would imagine that if it came out while I was a fan uh, and conscious about it, that would have been a little bit of a shock, but um, I heard the same thing that like with Peter Chris had only really brought a chorus and it was Beck. And then um, every time they tried to work on the, the, on the song, like he was too bombed or didn't want to deal with it and stuff. So the, <laughs> the other people in the band or the, kind of tertiary people in the studio kind of put together a lot of the, of the song. So like, like a certainly didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> you yeah. know? So like, um, and it's funny too, when um, the videos or they go on these, uh, you know, a variety shows in the seventies that they were constantly being called on there. It would be Peter Chris on a stool with a spotlight singing and then just kiss standing, like standing in the background. <laughs> Doing you know, nothing. Like, twiddle, yeah. Hands in their pockets like a like a stand up comedian, right? Yeah, like, being like, all dramatic, doing? you know, like the smoke, <laughs> you know, and Gene Simmons yeah. staring at, you know. And, and, and Beth has the distinction of of no other members. There's no members of Kiss on this because uh, the guitar the guitar work was done by Dick Wagner, who was with Alice Cooper, and then it's a, an orchestra and a piano. Um, yeah. and, and no other kiss and no other vocalist. So, and that's why I wrote that, that Beth is kisses yesterday. Cause yesterday for the Beatles was like that. It was the first time where, where it was a solo Beatle. There was no, no other Beatles involved in it uh, instrumentally. Um, but, but, the, but Beth is what brought, you know, love it or hate it. It, it could be an albatross around their neck now, but that's what brought them to those variety shows. That's, that's the, yeah. so, that's the song that kind of got them. Uh, got them in front of kids and got them in front of young people. Cause before that, yeah, you had to go to the record store. There was no MTV. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, this stuff w was played on radio, but maybe FM radio. Um, and Beth was, was what they were looking for. They were looking to reach a bigger audience and, and maybe this wasn't the perfect vehicle, but for the time, Eric, you, it, this was, this song was huge. It was, I think I even probably recorded it off the radio when I was like, 10 oh, years, it's, 10 well, years it's, old. it's, it remains. I mean, it's it's my favorite track off the album to be perfectly really? honest. Absolutely. Wow. I always, I always loved the song. Yeah. I mean, to <laughs> me, it was it's one of those like sentimental seventies yeah. tracks. But you know, but even now, it's a, it it still works. Yeah. That's in Detroit. It's a great City. song. It's a great song, yeah. and it yeah. fits right in with. And I love his vocal like, on it. Peter yeah. Chris is you know his yeah. vocal. He has got that that you know that emotion in the voice and the and the sort of rattle in his in his in his throat there you know i like He's, that you yeah know, peter so. peter chris has got some great songs like hard yeah. luck woman and hooligan and um you know black diamond mm -hmm. like he, he um he's got that raspy kind of bluesy yeah. kind of rock and roll voice it's it's a shame he didn't sing more yeah just uh mm -hmm. like every other band eric that we've done stuff about squabbling internal strife <laughs> it it, un, it, un, it undoes you right and then uh yeah. you know peter peter chris leaves you know they bring in eric carr and they didn't make eric carr a full member of the band so ace freely was like okay well i'm out I'll, i'm outvoted two to one now because you know paul and gene are pretty much always going to be in lockstep and and ace you know and ace was was be, becoming more disconnected anyway i mean so on this album that, that's why they got um, they got Dick Wagner to, to originally do the solo for Sweet Pain because Ace wasn't around. He's like playing cards or he was doing yeah. something else. It's kind of like, you know, so so it was very strange. Like these guys, it's, yeah, it's like, yeah, okay, I just won't show up. Yeah, someone else. I, like I, I would I would think I would have like the pride of you're not recording this without me. Like I'm the guitarist. Like I'm going to, you know, uh, I'm going to yeah. do this stuff. But but already the the, you know, the cracks were showing. Ace uh, was an interesting character, l collected Nazi memorabilia, and made lots of Hitler jokes to to Gene and Paul, who are Jewish. Yeah. So like they would, you know, uh, Gene Simmons would come in and say like, "Hey, why weren't you at practice or whatever?" And he'd like salute Hitler into Gene Simmons, and it's like, wow. But he, he was just it, I, he was so out of it that yeah. I think that he didn't he yeah. didn't realize that maybe he didn't know what he was doing. And the original Kiss logo. Yeah. was designed was designed by ace freely and the s's are the ss yep and yeah. um and they they had to change it in germany like if you look at the german import covers have a different s um so mm. i'm not saying he's a nazi i'm just saying he was just whacked out of his mind yeah. um and uh so there was he was crazy anyway he was just a little crazy anyway and the, i think that they just 
started hating each other and they just stopped, you know, showing up. Uh, I, I think that, you know, and, and, and Gene and Paul wanted to be like, keep the gravy train going, you know? Like, yeah, need, I, I, more I like yeah. Yeah. I, I, they looked at it as a business, you know, yeah. as a business concern and, you know, and that's what led down the road to, you know, after they, they took the makeup off, then they put the makeup on. They, they kind of decided, right. That these are now characters, you know, and you know, like, like we're not going to keep like with Vinnie Vincent, they did the Egyptian, the Ankh and the Fox with our car. And then it's like, no, these, you know, these, you know, the cat and, and, and space ace, the spaceman, they're characters and we could put anybody else into them and where that, you know, cause that's the characters quote unquote that people want to see. And, and, you know, so, so it, it almost made these people replaceable and in, 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 it kind of took the uniqueness away from the original core band because now it could be anybody underneath the makeup. And I guess I, I, in, in a way, I think they had said, well, the kiss can be, can kiss can now be immortal, right? Yeah. We can retire if we wanted to, although they're doing the holograms, but, but when they had thought about con- continuing, if I'm not mistaken, they said, well, we could just put, you know, we can put, send out a whole other group of people as kiss because it's, yeah. it's the icons. It's, it's the makeup. It's the characters that people want to see. That's one of the biggest things I disagree with as yeah. an artist and, uh, just somebody in marketing and that, I mean, it would have been like, they all had their lore. I mean, like they had comic yeah. books and stuff, introduce new characters. I mean, like, I understand that like nobody went for Vinnie Vincent's wizard that, that, you know, but he's there. He was a character and he came and kind of went. Uh, and then there was like the Fox and he kind of came and went and then uh spaceman and, and the cat are back. Yay. It's like, a, it's a, it's a soap opera, you know, like, like yeah. the, the, uh, or a, or a comic book when they, they came back for the, for the reunion. So it was like, I don't, I don't know. I, I just, it, uh, the cat makeup is, it's Peter Chris. Like it's yeah. just fried into my brain. There's no, there's an after image there. You can't not see that mm-hmm. and think, you know, you don't think Tommy Thayer, uh, yeah. Or know, Eric Singer, nothing, nothing against yeah. those guys. Sorry. But, sorry. Eric Singer. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're employees. They're, they're employees of kiss. Yeah. They're not in, in kiss per se. All right. Let's 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 uncork our, our segment. Three lies and a truth. Okay, okay. I, th- I think this is a good time for it. So, I'm going to read four statements, uh, A, B, C, and D. Right, I'll read them, and then uh, we'll let uh, we'll let Eric Eric will go first because I don't want because I'm, I'm going to leave the kiss expert for last because I don't want him to influence Eric. I want to I, I want to snag at least one of you. I don't know if I'm going to get Andy, so I got to try and snag one. I'm no expert. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to read four statements. Me. Four statements. Three of them are lies. One of them is true. Okay. okay. You ready? Yep. Don't say anything until I, I go Not through. Word. Um, okay. A. Kiss stands for Knights in Satan's Service. B. Gene Simmons' solo Kiss album is the biggest selling out of the four solo efforts that each band member put out. Okay. C. Kiss was the first band to sell out the Palladium in New York City without a record deal or or significant radio airplay. And D, final statement, Kiss made their first comic book appearance in Howard the Duck, the comic series Howard the Duck. So Eric, I'll give it to you again. A, Kiss actually stands for Knights in Satan's Service. B, Gene Simmons' solo Kiss album is the biggest seller of the four solo albums that they put out. Uh, C, Kiss was the first band to sell out the Palladium in New York City without a record deal or significant airplay. And D, Kiss made their first comic book appearance in, in Howard the Duck series because they did have uh, comic books and uh, they actually put their blood. I remember they put their blood. They gave their blood for the ink and Marvel and all that kind of stuff. So, Eric, three of those are false statements. They are not true. One of those fantastical factoids is real. Which one are you going with? Oh, so three of them are not true. Okay. Yeah, three three lies and a truth. Three of those are fake. Only one of those are true. Um I'm going to go with the comic book one. I'm going to go with the uh, for with D. So you say Kiss made their first comic book appearance at Howard the Duck. You're yeah. saying that's true. Okay. Yes. A- Andy, do you want me to read them to you again? No. Nope. Uh, okay. I, 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 it was Ace, uh, uh, Ace Fraley, uh, Ace Fraley's, uh, solo album was the best seller. Okay. New York Groove. So that's wrong. Uh, the Knights. So, Satan's so you Satan. say. Yeah. I, well, you know the answer. <laughs> I do. Uh, <laughs> Knights and uh, Knights and Satan service was some evangelical, like Billy Graham type character in okay. the seventies that were, that spread that rumor. Um, 
I'm not aware of the ticket sales for any of the venues back then. So that's very, very, um, that could be it. But the, the Howard the Ducks sounds very familiar. Um, because I, I yeah. don't know, I don't know if I, uh, if I had ever seen that, but for some reason that is pinging true. So it's, it's one of the last two. It's, it's either C or D. Or well, well, you got to give me true. one. What, one of those, one of those is, is false <laughs> and one of those is true, perhaps. Shit. Perhaps. Um, Going, going by your process of elimination. I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with Howard the Duck. You're going to go with Howard I, the Duck. Yeah. Okay. I, so I, three lies and a truth. Uh, a, KISS stands for Knights and Satan Service is incorrect. Gene Simmons says, I don't know where that came from. It, that's that's false. Yeah. Uh, B, Gene Simmons solo KISS album is the biggest seller of the four efforts. That is incorrect as well. Ace Freely's was, and it had back in the New York Groove, which was the biggest, the biggest non-KISS KISS hit probably, or, or the, mm-hmm. one of the, one of the, well, it's got the most longevity, or at least. Uh, C, Kiss was the first band to sell out the Palladium in New York City without a record deal or significant radio airplay. That is false. That okay, was actually good. Twisted Sister was what? the first really? band to sell out the Palladium in New York City without a record deal or radio airplay. So both of you gentlemen have won. Kiss made their first comic book appearance in Howard the Duck, specifically episode uh, issue number 12. Nice. Was the first, because they would make many appearances in Marvel comics. They would start yep. showing up, Spider-Man and all this other stuff, but their very first was Howard the, Howard the Duck, number 12. Congratulations, so gentlemen. Yay. Three lies and a truth, and you have worked your way to the truth. Congratulations. So what do we win? What do we win? Bragging rights until the next okay. episode. <laughs> <laughs> Bragging rights until the until the next episode. Because now, you know, um, I, I I knew I I knew some of that. I, I thought I was going to get Andy with the Gene Simmons one because I knew I, I, no. if I switched out the names. I was going to kind of like, oh, mm. you know. I knew that wasn't true. I uh, was either good at I I I thought it was Peter Chris that his okay. album sold the best. I I thought for sure that was, uh, but uh, but I knew I, it wasn't Gene. I have yeah. a good, I have a fun uh, factoid about Gene Simmons solo. Uh, do you know who sang backup, uh, female backup vocals yes. on that album? I, I do. I'll leave it to Eric, though. His girlfriend I, at the time. Uh, who would that be? Oh, well, there were a lot. Yeah. But, <laughs> but one, one in particular was actually a singer and had hits at the time. Yeah, Andy, uncork, I, uncork I don't know. it. Well, I don't know. Uh, Katie Seagal, Peg Bundy oh. was on was on the album. But yeah, there's also um, who were you going to say? Cher. Cher was is she on the album? I know I he believe, was dating. I Cher believe for she. A while. I believe she was on the album also. Yeah, my um, girlfriend. What is that? I, I, what, I didn't say your girlfriend. That's what you said. Oh, his girlfriend. His girlfriend. Oh, Gene oh, yeah, his girl. girl. I'm sorry, yeah, I was not I your girlfriend. Me. <laughs> I don't, know, I don't know who you were dating. I thought you meant it to say, and I had a crush on Cher. I'm like, no, no, I don't. no, 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 no. I, I don't know who you were dating in the 70s. Cher and uh, <laughs> Cher and um, Katie uh, Seagal from uh, Mario. Katie Trump. Seagal and uh, he, there was he a lot dated, of people on there. He dated, um, oh my goodness, uh, a lot. Uh, he dated, yeah. I can see her in my Diana Ross. Jesus. Oh really? Um, yeah. Wow. All right. Yeah, Diana Ross too. Are they uh, are they still around. married though? Him and Shannon Tweed are they still? I think, I think so. Yeah. I don't know how. I yeah, they think, might I be can't. together. <laughs> They're still together, perhaps. Yeah, I, uh, I, there were, yeah, there was some uncomfortable uh, TV interviews. There was that one yeah. uh, where she was just like so mad, at, like something came up, and he's just so like flippant about a lot of things, and he probably doesn't mean to be, but I think he he can't help but being Gene when the cameras are on. Yeah, you know, he might yeah. be a sweetheart when the cameras are off, but when the cameras are on, he's, he's Gene. He's on, and, you know, yeah. he starts, he starts his autobiography essentially saying, um, I have never had a problem loving myself. I've never had a problem telling people that I'm not doing what I don't want to do, or, uh, I will never compromise my happiness or, or any of like, it, it's just, there's like a paragraph of like <laughs> all the things that you're taught his manifesto are, yeah are, all the things that you're taught not to do you know like he's just like i will never not be selfish i will never get married i will never uh compromise huh? for a woman i will never and he's like i've known that since i was a kid and I, you can't expect me to change now so right. F- fair um, enough you know it, it's the gene simmons manifesto and at, at least he's letting you know what to expect then you know at least he's not try- at least he's not trying to pretend that he's something that he's not then that's I that's suppose. true so, all right let's get back to destroyer let's talk about some favorite tracks here 
Yeah. Uh, Eric, you said Beth is your topper, but what at what besides that? Because that's an, such an outlier that there's no other songs like it. Detroit what, Rock City. Detroit Rock City is, is the that's one. That's always been my probably my favorite song by them. Because it's get it's up, the one get down. I, yeah. <laughs> just the opening, the whole like ambient noise thing in the beginning, uh, and the and the you know, it just kind of and it it takes a while too for the song to get going. Yeah. It's, almost, it's almost two minutes. You you're yeah. going into like a minute forty five. And then the song kicks in, and I just love that riff. And it just, yeah. Any it's other one? Ones? I, th- I think it's one of their stronger. stronger great, ex- tracks. great expectations. Yeah. No, 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 no. No, can't, can't. We can't get. We can't get you on the great expectations train with the with the bells. No, there's the, some like the, there's some good st- stuff on here, but I mean, I think those to me those might be the two for me. There's two strongest tracks on the record in terms sure. of production, in terms of you know just solid songs. You know, I mean, you, Beth with the with the yeah. with the you know, the orchestration and all that, they really went to town with, you know, I think with these tracks in, um, yeah. in that sense. Absolutely. So, yeah. Andy, Andy, what do you got? Uh, well, Detroit Rock City is, uh, it's part of the furniture now. Like, I mean, we've heard the song 800 mm-hmm. million times, but like when you, when you listen to the song and you're into it and you have, you're like, you're invested. Yeah. Uh, it, it gives me goosebumps. Like the, when the whole song stops and it's just the little guitar solo. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it, and then everything kicks in and it shoots back off, you know, I mean, even, even the, 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 the riffs uh, during the vocals, it's just drums and the bass kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I love that so much. The Detroit rock city is just on a whole other, there's like, there's a mood to it. That's got um, uh, it, it's just, uh, it's the same thing with Love Gun. The song Love Gun, mm-hmm. it, it just feels like a different, like they they transcended for a little while, you know, and did this, you know, there, there's layers and there's feeling. They, they, they achieved what ki- like what Kiss sh- in a perfect world would be, right? Like that's yeah. kind of like the, the, the perfect examples of that. What, what else besides Detroit Rock City? Can I get, can I get you for uh, great expectations? Can I mark you down for that or no? No. Oh, oh shit. Uh, minus, minus so obsessed one. with the song. <laughs> yeah. I, because you're, we know it's so bad. Nobody is more obsessed with that song than Gene Simmons. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think that um, uh, Flaming is pretty cool. Sweet Pain, it's all right. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at the list right now. Shout It Out Loud is that's a another great one, song. Right? Of course. Yeah. Song. I mean, that's the end of – That's that, I think that the, if I remember correctly, that's the, the, the last song on the uh, – Kiss meets the Phantom of the Park. That's like the crescendo of the movie. Yeah, I the think. finale yeah. Uh, or the beginning. I, I don't remember which one it was, but I mean, it's just I, I associate that with uh, that song uh-huh. even more so than Rock and Roll All Night with like the the marketing, the mm-hmm. bigness, and the crowds and the carnivals and the, you know fire and all that stuff or whatever. So yeah, I you know it's it's tough. It's tough for me because you know I. There's probably I don't know how many songs they put out. It's like the Beatles. The Beatles put yeah. out like 200 songs. Yeah, but you can't even like. And then they they keep finding them. <laughs> like mm-hmm. there's another Beatles song that nobody you know or whatever. But I mean, it's same thing with Kiss. They put out so many songs, and um, yeah, they're super the, prolific. I mean, these guys worked worked at a breakneck pace in this. I mean, they slowed down actually after Love Gun, right? Yeah, they kind of yeah yeah. Well, they, the they, again, like they had the, the Beatles mentality of like, we got to put out a song or an album a year, or we're going to, you know, we got to keep it, get momentum going or whatever, yeah. which, you know, um, but you know, if, let, let's say they have 200 songs. I absolutely love 60 of them, like love them, yeah. you know, and then there's probably 10 or 15 of them that I just despise. And then the other ones are fine. But I mean, like those six, those 65 are like, I will listen to them till I die. Like they're on mm-hmm. all my playlists, you know, they're just, they're just such good songs. Um, so there's, there's only, a, uh, this is my favorite kiss album, but there's probably only out of the 10, probably six that I really, really love. Yeah. Rock and um, roll party doesn't really count. Cause it's, it's a yeah. minute 20 and it's not really a song, but it has like, it has three songwriters, but it's not even in, an instrumental. It's just kind of just noise. It's like, crowd. Yeah. It's like crowd noise almost. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> So, so, yeah. so we'll, we'll call it nine songs, six out of nine. That's that's two yeah. thirds of the album. So you're in good shape there. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm yeah. going to go with Detroit Rock City and King of the Nighttime World together. Like I said, I just love how those yeah. two songs are, are kind of mashed together. And and again, for me, for, for someone quote unquote new to Kiss, um, yeah. I really like it. Just kind of it kept me propelled. You know, there, there wasn't a stop. It, and 
and there really wasn't a change in direction. It just kind of brought me into the next song, which I really kind of dug for, again, for someone kind of listening to this and, 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 and coming to it and, and, and expose it because I've never listened to a complete kiss album. You know, this is the first time, you know, full disclosure. I know the hits, but I've never list, sat down and listened. So for me, it was great. And then flaming youth. I, I, you know, I, I started to get a really an appreciation for what, what Paul Stanley does and, and how he does it and why he's, why he's the front man for kiss. Like he, you know, he, he get, he can, like I said, he can take the schmaltzy stuff, but he can sell it, yeah, you know, and that's yeah. the key. That's the key for those kids. And for the yeah. young people that that they're going to believe that they're going to throw their fist in the air when he's talking about that, about moms and dads and people don't understand or, you know, uh, that, you know, getting in my car and, and that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I really got a more of an appreciation for for Paul Stanley uh, after after really diving into this album. So I'll, I'll go with Flaming Youth as well. It, it's catchy. It has, it's catchy. It has, I was un, unexpected. I wasn't expecting yeah. it to be like so catchy and poppy. And that that's why I like the God of that's why I like the Paul Stanley version of God of Thunder because it's kind of yeah it's a little it's it's I was made for loving you esque right it's yeah. got that disco yeah. beat but I you know both versions are good because they're so different you yeah know, they're uh, so different in his in his autobiography Paul said that he was having a hard time figuring out who he wanted to be as a front man and one of the shows he just kind of broke into a a preacher like a an a, a, a evangelist and mm. he's just like. I know you all people here today want to listen to some rock and roll, you know, and then like the crowd went nuts and he's like, okay, well, I'm going to do this. And he just started doing it. And like, that was, that's his that's persona. It. He's the evangelist of rock and roll. And like, if you uh, listen to him in between all the songs now, and you know that he's doing the, the, the Southern preacher uh, of, of rock and roll sort of thing. But, you know, Dean, I'll, I'll throw you together a playlist of uh, songs you need to hear. If you, uh, I'll, I'll yeah. cut through the meat, uh, cut through the fat for you. Yeah. Send it to me. I uh, well, play kissed. <laughs> a play kissed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what one thing I was I was gonna one of one of going just running going back to the uh, three lies and a truth. Yeah. One of the lies I was gonna make up, which I think would have stumped Andy, was because um, Kiss was on Casablanca Records, mm -hmm. and there was another very popular group that was on Casablanca Records. So one of my the the lie was going to be that Casablanca Records was trying to uh, get Kiss to team up and and make a song with the Village People. Oh, it was Donna Summer. Because no, Vill village people were on Casablanca too. Oh, are they really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they were, I, you know, I, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, they were mainly like that kind of disco label. And it was odd that that Kiss was on Casablanca Records. That's so funny. Because it was kind of not that, you know, so that was going to be my, I was trying to figure out a way to word it. And then I kind of was like, yeah. oh, I forget it. You know, but I think that might have stumped you. If I had said they, they Casablanca yeah. Records was trying to put the village people and Kiss together. I think that would have made you think you were like, wow. It would have. Yeah. I just, I know Donna Summer, they were like, <laughs> they were pushing the two and they were even on compilation albums together because they really? were trying to put. k -Tel, the, they were Kiss, they Donna were, Summer. They were, they were the two <laughs> children, I guess. Yeah. I mean, you know, lo love to love your baby isn't, isn't the most radio friendly thing either from no. Donna Summer. I mean, nope. that, you know, that's kind of, uh, you know. I'm kind of get you it. going too. And it's you yeah. know, not, not for, not mm -hmm. safe for kids uh, either. So um, I think that's going to do it for, for destroyer. I got to say my eyes were opened to, to kiss. I kind of, I, you know, the, not that I di didn't respect them. I just didn't really kind of get really, I don't want to say pay them no mind, but didn't really kind of go, go and explore them a little bit. So I'm so glad that we did because I really, I, I swear I listened to this album so many times and each time I kind of, I kind of, understood it a little bit more. And, and like I said, that, that, that kind of veneer of kind of judging them for the way they act personally and for how they treated, you know, Peter, Chris, and, you know, like I, I, like Andy said, I kind of put that, I, I tried to put that aside and go back into the, into 76 when these guys were a cohesive unit and they were hungry uh, and, and they weren't that yet. And they were trying to get there, you know, and we can talk about what, you know, how they acted when they got there, but, but destroyer, um, it has such an ominous title, but it's really just great. Like pop, it's kind of poppy. It's, it's heavy, but it's, it's fist pumping rock and roll. And, and there's not much more you get. 76 was a great year for that. You know, that was kind yes, of, it was. right. Yeah. Eric, that was kind of like the thing. It was like about it. You know, it was the bicentennial. It was America. It was, it was I, all that I had great a stuff. lot of fond memories of that year. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Some great albums came out that year, yeah. including hotel California. Yeah. New, uh, new world, the, new world record, new world record. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, the first Boston <laughs> album. I mean, you, you know, yeah, there was a lot that on. was going on. 
but uh, but yeah, I, I you know from my experience with the band, I mean as, as a kid, I, I I was enamored with the whole like Andy, the whole sort of image, as it were. But you know, it kind of lends itself to some of the stuff that that eventually would would take place in the '80s with MTV and stuff. So there were a lot of bands that making that kind of noise then, you know, that kind of thing, you know, throwing that that ridiculous sort of no, the things out there, uh, and of course with music videos it was even more, it got even more sort of like, you know, but everybody was doing it. Yeah. Kiss might've been one of the first bands to actually put on a show without even having to put on a show, you know? Right. I mean, because all they needed to do was just wear the makeup and yeah, just, even right if they're, right just away, they're like selling that. action yeah. figures and comic books and think star Wars before star Wars, yeah. for God's yeah. sake. I mean, you're, you're talking about, yeah. I mean, they were just, and they, they, Knew what they were doing. They leaned into it, and like Andy was saying, I, I, you got to respect that. You yeah, respect they brought the fact they that they were it. unapologetic. Yeah, so they yep. brought it, and and they were, you know, being <clears throat> flown around on wires, and they're wearing twenty pounds of costume and yeah. makeup, and uh, you know, <laughs> uh, so you know, they did they they didn't clock in. I mean, they or did, didn't just clock in. You know, they yeah. they they did their they did their thing. Every, yeah, they they paid their time. dues when it wasn't uh, the hip thing to do, but it, then it paid off where they became much much beloved. So, uh, yeah. check this out. It's on streaming services. There is a a remastered version of Destroyer. Um, you know because because they felt that that some improvements could be made. So Bob Ezrin got the tapes, digitally transferred them, and and kind of remixed it. So that's there as well with a whole bunch of extra material as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, all the demos and all that kind of stuff. But if you just want the the original experience, which I, I recommend you do, just listen to Destroyer, listen to those those 10 songs, listen to that statement and you'll get where they were uh, in 76. And I think that is so important to to understand. This is this is another one of those, for, I think, Rock and Roll 101 albums. You really should listen to this one and, and it, it gives you a flavor for when, when they were hungry, like I said, today it's easy to look at them as just this business concern and this, you know, promotion machine. But back then, they 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 were guys that were just banging albums out, trying to get that brass ring. Yeah, you yeah. know, and and this I, was the album that that they reached for, it and and they they finally did grab it after like five yeah. five albums in two years. I mean, that that's just an ins that's like Chicago style prolific, right, Eric? I mean, Chicago yeah. was on that pace, that, but they did it with double albums. It, they did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but same yeah. type of thing. So uh, that's going to do it for this episode of the Thirty Three Twenty Four Podcast. If you've been watching us on YouTube, you see R two or Little Arthur is still behind Andy. He's still waiting patiently for some direction or some orders. Um, there he is, no. R two. Um, check us out on you. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and give us a like and a subscribe. And if you're <laughs> <Excuse me. laughs> He's got a lot to say. Oh. He's making the final comments there. <laughs> I don't uh, like you at all. Well, I don't like you either. You know, it's, anyway, nobody likes you. I don't like you either. Um, <laughs> make sure you let you subscribe, follow us on, on your favorite podcast platform as well. So this way you get notified uh, when new episodes drop, but here's the hint. It's every Thursday, but do it anyway, just so you get the nice gentle reminder. Uh, don't forget Andrew Cremeen's art on Instagram. We're going to put a link in the show notes. Plus I'm going to put a link for the alternate version of God of Thunder. I think you guys can check that. Andy sent it and and I thought, I, I listened to it. And I'm like, I dig this. It, it hits me in my pop feels. So it was like kind of in my wheelhouse. Um, but let us know on social media how you feel about that version. Is is it is the demon meant to sing it or uh, is it better as a little pop disco-y uh, ditty by its by its author? And Andy's like, no, it's it's bombast. It's demon. It's roaring. It's all that stuff that 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 Gene brings to it. Uh, Andy, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. It's always a pleasure. I'm it's, always happy to be here. Yeah, and, and we will have you back on again real soon, as always, with uh, little Arthur in tow as well. And maybe you'll have a three PL behind you. No, no, that's too expensive. No, yeah. what about a hammerhead? Yeah. Sure. I'll take one. <laughs> Get the hammerhead replica. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like I said, we'll, we'll drop that link in the show notes. Check out Andy on Instagram. He's got a, he's a busy man, but he does a lot of great work. Uh, and he's got the samples there that you can look at it and give him a follow as well. So you can keep up with what he's doing. And uh, as always, Eric and I will be in our, our comfy chairs, just waiting until next week until we, we catch up with you again. Uh, and thanks for checking us out. We're on Instagram and Facebook as well. We've got a great group. Go check us out there too. So, for Andy, 
And for Eric, this has been Dean. And we will catch you on the flip side.